Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit today about test benching, and we're going to do a basic introduction. Now, our introduction is just that. It's an introduction. Very, very simple waveform generator is what we're going to talk about, and the structure of test bench and the philosophy behind test benching. We're going to save a discussion for more in-depth test benching, uh, an advanced uh, test benching after we've talked about some processes. It gives us a lot more power to create some really nice test benches. So right now we're just basically introducing test benches in, in our discussion. So let's get started. Uh, the first thing to recognize is that in a test bench, you're basically creating a component and that component is basically going to be a place for you to test your design. So your design is placed inside this component as a component itself, right? So you've got your test bench and then you put your design in it and then you bring into the test bench other ways of stimulating the signal. So what the idea is here, you're trying to apply signals to the inputs of your design and make sure the outputs of your design are performing the way you expect them to. And you wanna really give it a good thorough test to test as many combinations of inputs as you can and, and different scenarios and situations that you may not have anticipated. And then you can look at the outputs on your simulation tool to see what the outputs look like. So you can include things like, uh, let's see, we can put in a counter. Uh, we can put in a waveform generator or a clocking system. So if we have a system that has a, a system clock and it's counting or doing other fancy stuff, a state machine for instance, then we can add that to our test bench and then use it as a way to stimulate the other uh, signals. Now, the test bench, as you can imagine, is, is the reason we call it a test bench is it's very similar to what an electronic test bench would be, right? So let's say you create a design in an electronic test bench and you take that design, whatever that design is, and you set it down on the bench, right? And then you've got all these instruments around you that you can use, like a waveform generators, right? Um, and you can apply those to those and you can and you can stimulate the design and make it do the things you're wanting it to do. And that's no different than the simulation test bench inside VHDL. You take your component, you set it down on the table or the test bench, and then you apply signals to the input and see what happens. That's the whole idea. And this kind of verification is incredibly valuable and very, very important and will save you hundreds of hours of debug uh, before you start wiring up any hardware in your design, right? So the first thing you want to do is run a test bench. In fact, every single component you make will likely need to use some sort of a test bench to test that component to make sure it functions the way you want it to. So it provides a powerful design verification. That's what test benches do. They allow you to verify the functionality of your design. Uh, and the important thing is it also offers repeatable uh, reuse of your testing method. So for instance, let's say you've created a design um, for your component and then you run a test bench against it and everything looks great. So the design's working perfect. Then you come up with an epiphany that says, you know, the way we did that design in the past, the constructions we used and how we put it together, I bet we could optimize it and get better speed out of it. Uh, but we still don't want to damage the functionality, right? So you can take the same test bench you did before and use it to test the new component configuration by just plopping your new component in the design and running it again and making sure the outputs are the same as they were before. So reuse of the test bench is a valuable thing, especially if you go in and tweak the design and the methods in which you're using to define your system. Uh, that's gonna be important. Now, one of the things that, that, is, that is sometimes difficult to understand is that for, for people that are new to this, is that sometimes your test bench, in fact, most of the time your test bench will not be synthesizable. So it's not, it's generally not something that you can synthesize. You, you, you can't run it into hardware. And the, part of the reason for that is because you're using some of the instructions in VHDL that are just simply not synthesizable. You can't synthesize it. Let me give you an example. There is an instruction in VHDL that says, wait for, and then you can give a time. So we could say, wait for 100 nanoseconds, okay? Well, that's not hardware. You can't basically write an instruction in VHDL and say, wait for 100 nanoseconds. Clock frequencies have to come from somewhere. They're generally a, a clock system on your hardware, uh, a clocking source, and it runs at a certain frequency, say 100 megahertz, 
and and so it has you know a certain set frequency you just can't willy-nilly change it and then in order to get a certain frequency that you're looking for you might have to run it through a clock divider to get that frequency down to a level that you're looking for and all of that is sophisticated digital circuitry right it's not a simple command on a vhdl prompt so you can't just say wait for 100 nanoseconds without knowing first what the clock is and also even if you know the clock, it may not be possible to divide the clock down so that it is exactly 100 nanoseconds, right? So it might end up being 94.6, and then the next one up might be 103.4. It just depends on the frequency that the oscillator is oscillating at in your design. So it's an unsynthesizable command, but it's incredibly useful for testing your design before you try to put it in hardware. So you can generate these signals send them into your design, see how your design handles it, and then if it's handling it properly, then move on to putting it in hardware and doing the hardware test or you know, deciding on a clock signal and figuring out what your divider needs to be. So generally, when you're creating a test bench, you don't worry about whether it's synthesizable because you really normally don't care. It's in software, it's, it's about synthesizing your design, and so you write instructions that make it more, make it clear what you're trying to test and make it you know quick, pretty quick and easy to put together. Uh, and then it'll test your hardware that way in software. And then when you get ready to put your design in your actual hardware, you'll have to use a physical fixture for that because it is actual hardware. One of the things that I like to do and the reason I like to use test benches is because I like to keep all of my code vendor independent. You, you don't wanna tie yourself to a particular manufacturer. Um, You'll, you'll get pressure to do so because they'll provide a lot of neat and fancy tools that are part of their tool set and say, you know, look at this shiny thing over here. We can drop this in here and you've got, you know, here's a clock source, boom, here's a, you know, don't do that. Uh, you want to be vendor independent. You want to be able to shift gears from vendor A when vendor B's price goes down and they offer a better feature. So some other company comes in a year from now and says, hey, I've got this great new um, device that you really should think about switching to. And if you have designed and, and created test benches all in somebody's uh, IDE environment, you know, for that particular company, the transition to the other one is going to be difficult. Um, it's not impossible. In fact, most vendors provide features to allow you to, to, to bring uh, others from more uh, popular uh, IDEs into their system. But it's just a bad road to go down. You don't want to be dependent on anyone for your design. You want to keep as, as much of your design vendor independent as you possibly can. All right, so let's take a look at what a test bench can look like on the inside. Now inside the test bench, like we said before, we can create clocks and counters and other custom waveforms Notice that when we do use a test bench, we drop our component in here, our design, whatever that happens to be, into the test bench itself. Okay, so this would be the test bench. And then we label it UUT, which is unit under test. This is just standard, it's not required, but it's a standard way of referencing uh, a, a, a test component inside a test bench, right? So it's just call it UUT. Unit under test is what it stands for, and that's just a well understood nomenclature. The other thing that's important is that when you do drop your component in the test bench, uh, you wanna pay attention to the naming, and you wanna make the names of the port of your, your component. Remember, your component has input and output ports, and it has names. So it's by convention, you would name internal signals in the test bench architecture, the wires to hook things up, give them the same name as the port names. And there's no conflict there because a signal member is different than a port and, and the system understands that. So you'll notice that N1 and N1 are there the same and N2 and N2 are the same. So we've created these internal signals uh, to pass into our unit and we've given them the same names. Notice we're using a vector here to test with. So we've got our uh, input here is an eight bit value. It's feeding from a counter component that we've created in our test bench. We've dropped in a clock. Uh, we can set that clock frequency to whatever we want. It's software, so it's a software simulation. And then it'll generate the clock signals that are coming out of here. And then I can create some custom waveform that I want to input. Maybe I want to simulate 
uh, traffic flow in a, in a traffic sensor, right? So I can just simulate spikes at varying random different times and see how the system responds to it. And so this is basically how, how it works. Now, when we get into the more advanced part of our, our test benching, uh, we'll start talking about things like test vectors and also verification circuitry. So in other words, not just having you look at these on a simulator, but also running them through some verification decoder to find out if there was an error or not. So, and that's a little more advanced. That's when we get to the advanced uh, uh, test benching, okay? But that's basically what you can do with a test bench. The best way to learn something like this is to actually do an example. And so what I've done is put together a little example using our intro. So if we take a look at the intro, this is the intro example where we count the number of switches and then we output the, um, the LED count, right? But we wanna run a test bench to see how that functions first in software, and then we can port it to hardware and see how it works in the hardware. The key thing that I want you to notice here is a test bench is fundamentally just an architecture entity, an entity architecture pair where the entity has no ports, okay? This is the unusual thing about a test bench. The entity actually has no ports. And because the entity has no ports, it's, it, it's called an empty entity and you just declare the entity and then follow it with in entity and you're done. And we'll see that declaration soon. But it doesn't need ports because all the signals that it gets is gonna be from internal things that you've added, such as say the switch driver here that I have in this one. And the switch driver creates signals on these S1, S2, and S3 lines to feed into my unit under test. And then I'll use the simulator to look at the outputs to see what they look like in a waveform. So this is gonna create a nice waveform for us to show us how the outputs react to the inputs in the simulator. It's a very, very powerful uh, construct here or concept, the idea of being able to generate just custom signals and then feeding them into your design to see what happens on the output. Uh, so let's take a look, let's break this apart again. Let's take a look at all the little pieces. First off, no ports on the test bench. That's a critical element. No ports on the test bench. Your unit under test is the component that goes in here. The port and signal names are the same. This is just by convention. It's not required, but it is a good practice to do when you're creating a test bench. And then all the signals that are in here, all these signals here, right? All those signals, those signals can be looked at in the software on the simulation tool. So the simulation tool will plot out waveforms showing, you know, time domain waveforms of the, of the signals changing. And you can watch as their input signals change and watch how the output signals change uh, when those input signals change. So you can apply a stimulus and then watch the outputs as they change in the software before you even run this in, in any piece of hardware. So what does code that do, does this look like? How does that code get structured? And, and let's, so let's take a quick look at that. Now, one of the things I do wanna do is look at the first off the declaration of the entity. So if we look at the entity, you'll notice that the entity is empty. In other words, there are no input ports or output ports on this entity. You declare the entity intro underscore TB, and then that's it. Now, by convention, when we create a test bench, it's a good idea to use the entity's name as the first part of that name of the test bench, and then follow that with an underscore and a capital T and capital B. That's understood to be a test bench. That means this test bench is designed to go with that entity. Remember, you're testing a particular entity inside your test bench. So it's good to go ahead and identify that test bench as being associated with that entity. And to do that, we can just name it underscore TB. So when you're looking at it in your design, you'll know exactly where that goes and what its purpose is. The other thing that we want to look at is the way in which you embed the component in. And we've, we saw this in the intro example, we're doing it again. Here, to clarify, we declare the whole component with its inputs and outputs inside the architecture, right? So we redeclare it with all its inputs and all its outputs. And then, right after that, we declare all the signal connections for that. Now, remember what we said before? 
you want in your in your test bench it's a good idea to put the component in and basically that component will then attach to signals of the same name as the port signals all right so to see that here you can see that we've declared a signal sw1 which corresponds to that port we've declared a signal led3 which corresponds to that one so all of these have signals that correspond to uh, the, por the port pins on the component I'm testing. And this is just by convention so that you don't get confused as to what these values are uh, when you're running your test bench and you're looking at the signals so there's no confusion. So it's just a good idea. Now that we've done that, let's take a look at the actual declaration of our um, test bench architecture. And we can look, first off, we've declared the component with the name of UUT. We talked about UUT being the unit under test. And then we port map that, and now we uh, attach all the signals. Now, this is a new way of, of specifying these connect connections. In this, con in this configuration, we connect switches using what's called named association. Remember before we would do some, some things called um, positional association, this is named association. So we're basically saying that switch one port is connected to switch one signal, switch two port is connected to switch two signal, and so on. And, and we're giving, since we gave them the same names, there's no, you know, they're, they're both the same name, but they are different things. One is the port name and the other is a signal name external to that that you're attaching it to. The next thing we've got is a switch driver process and the switch driver process generates signals for us to apply on the inputs. Now, this is not a complete test bench by any means. It's basically an example to show you how to apply a few signals. If I were going to do this properly, I would want to make sure to apply all possible combinations of three-bit inputs, and that would mean at least eight different test cases, right? What you have here is just four. You have basically half the test cases you would need to make sure that this is working properly. But it's a good example of how to how to do things. So now this process is notable in the sense that this process does not have any sensitivity list. OK, so there's no sensitivity list here. That means that this process requires a wait statement. We're going to talk more in detail about what processes require later in later videos. But for now, this process actually uh, requires wait statements in order to be functioned properly because you have to be able to terminate a process uh, as, as, as it executes. And we'll find out why as well when we start talking about delta cycles and other things. But for now, all we're doing is assigning signals or values to our signals. So we start by assigning all the switch inputs zero and then we wait for 20 nanoseconds. This is that special instruction I was talking about. So, boom, all zeros, 20 nanoseconds later, we're going to change it to 010, wait for 20 nanoseconds, and it's going to hold 010, and then, boom, change it to 101, and then wait for 20 nanoseconds, so it's going to be 101 for 20 nanoseconds, and then after that, it will switch all on, and then all will be on, and now we have... We end the whole design or the whole block, process block, with a single wait statement. And that's required. You can't just, you can't just have a process end because a process doesn't end. It loops back around to the beginning if there's no sensitivity list. And we'll talk about why that's the case and how that works uh, when we get into deep into processes. But suffice it to say, you have to have that weight at the end, and if any of you have kind of experimented and didn't put it there, you've probably noticed some weird performance uh, coming out of your system if you didn't put it there. So you got you probably were missing the 111. You're like, where's the 111? So I don't know how that worked. But uh, that's okay. We're going to talk about how that does later. The key things I want to leave you with is UUT is the name of the component. I name the process that I'm using to generate uh, these signals called switch driver. And this corresponds very closely to the diagram. Uh, let's see, this diagram here, we'll use this one. It corresponds very closely to this diagram where I have my process 
my test bench on the outside. I have the switch driver process that generates the signals. And then I have the UUT that I'm using to test the signals on. And then when I get in the simulator, I will look at LED signals and I can even look at the switch signals that I'm applying on a waveform diagram inside software to see how it's functioning. And that's the basic structure of a test bench. So it's not anything fancy or super difficult. It's just a process that really helps you make sure your design works before you commit to doing things in hardware and, and creating uh, more problems. Because it's easy to fix things in software, but when you started uh, advancing the hardware phase, then it's gonna be more difficult to fix things in the end. So that's it for, for our test bench intro. Remember, we've got more advanced test benching coming later. But this will get us started now, and uh, so happy coding, and we'll see you guys in the next video.